A few years ago, I came across a movie that was set during World War II, but it was a horror movie with zombies. I had heard about this movie beforehand, watched the trailer, and thought, well, that's not gonna be any good. And I had already been incredibly disappointed because this movie was at one point going to be connected to the Cloverfield universe, but it ended up being its own thing entirely. But after watching it, I found my expectations were entirely flawed, because not only is this a great movie, but it works far better as a standalone film, rather than being connected to any specific universe. The film I'm talking about is, of course, Overlord. I've watched Overlord a few times since I first saw it, I even bought it on Blu-ray and I only ever buy movies that I plan on watching multiple times, but after watching it recently it only just occurred to me the similarities it has with Call of Duty Zombies. You know, the storyline it had in the beginning, not what it eventually ended up becoming. I've been a big fan of Call of Duty Zombies for a while, and even just alternate history World War II stuff like Wolfenstein and The Man in the High Castle, and Overlord perfectly scratches the horror action war itch that you might have at any given time. So if you've never seen Overlord and you don't care about spoilers, I'm going to be recapping the film and then giving my analysis as to why this is such an underrated film in general. If you've seen the movie, then you can skip the recap, or if you want to watch it beforehand, then I'd highly recommend you do so, and then come back to the video. So let's drop down in the middle of World War II, discover the secrets that the Axis powers held, and grab a flamethrower as we go through the story of Overlord. The film wastes no time setting anything up, we start off airborne in a plane full of American soldiers. They've been given a mission to destroy a radio tower that's actually a church, so that the American invasion of Normandy can have a chance at being successful. We're introduced to the characters, there's Boyce, the protagonist, a softer and kind man who was forced to join the army because... Well, this was World War II. There's Tibbet, the typical macho and confident soldier. Chase, the photographer. Jacob, the more shy and fearful soldier who's friends with Boyce. Dawson, a pretty laid back soldier, not overly fearful for his life. And Corporal Ford, the leader of the mission and a man who's already been in the war for some time. There's also the sergeant, who informs them all they're about 90 minutes from the drop point, so some time goes by and when it's almost time to drop, the plane gets attacked. They're forced to go down early, not everybody on board making it even out of the plane. We follow the journey down through Boyce's point of view. He lands in the water, cuts himself free, and swims ashore. The German patrols cover the ground and they start shooting at him, so he runs looking for any other survivors. He eventually finds the sergeant, who's surrounded by Germans. Wanting to try and save him, he readies his weapon, only to be stopped by Corporal Ford. The sergeant gets killed, and Ford tells Boyce that there's nothing they could have done, and they have to continue on with the mission. So they do continue on, running into Tibbet, Chase, and Dawson. Assuming they're the only survivors left of the drop, they continue onward. Dawson tells the others that he's writing a book about the war, he hopes to sell it when he gets back, even wanting to team up with Chase to get some photos in the... Shaken up, the others get through the minefield and into the forest, where they see a woman walking alone. She runs, and Ford says that they can't have anybody know that they're here, so they run after her. When they catch up, they learn that she doesn't speak English, only French, but luckily Boyce knows how to communicate. They learn her name is Chloe, and she lives in the village that the church is in. She takes them there, where they hope to take some refuge in her house. Ford, Tibbet, and Chase go to scout the house while Boyce stays with Chloe, given the instruction to shoot her if she runs because they can't have her alerting the guards of their presence. So of course Chloe runs off and Boyce doesn't shoot her, and she's caught by the guards. The guard in charge, Franz Waffner, lets her go. Boyce returns to his fellow soldiers, saying that he doesn't think that she told them anything, and Chloe says that she didn't, in English. She says that she needed to know if she could trust them first, but now that she can, she invites them into her home. Inside Chloe's home lives her sick aunt and her younger brother Paul. The soldiers take camp up in the attic, counting their explosives for the mission. Ford sends Tibbet and Chase to go and scout the area and see if there's a way inside the church. Paul wants Tibbet to play catch with him, but Tibbet yells at him and walks away. Ford then instructs Boyce to go downstairs and make sure nobody else leaves or comes inside. 
On the way downstairs, Boyce hears noises coming from the ant's room and investigates, seeing an absolutely grotesque looking ant. Chloe offers to clean the wound on his shoulder and they end up talking. Boyce tells her that three months before this, he was at his house and the army showed up and told him that he was now a soldier. Chloe tells him that her parents have been killed, and her aunt looks like that because of the experiments being conducted at the church. They get a little flirty when a knock at the door comes. Boyce retreats upstairs, and in walks Franz Wafter. Ford and Boyce watch their conversation through slits in the floor upstairs. Chloe is obviously very uncomfortable with Wafner's presence, and after Paul drops the ball and the Americans almost get caught, Wafner gets a little too forward, forcing Boyce to come down to put an end to his attempt. Ford headbutts Wafner and knocks him out, telling Boyce that he has compromised the mission and sends him to go and get Tibbet and Chase. Boyce goes to find them, but he can't, witnessing the heavily armed entrance into the church and some of the things they're doing to the patients. So he heads back and gets chased by a guard dog. Boyce jumps into one of the Germans' trucks filled with bodies, a truck heading into the church. Boyce finds his way quietly out of the truck and into the facility, unaware of the horrors he would find within. As he walks through, he sees many different human experiments, avoiding guards as he makes his way through the facility where he eventually stumbles upon his fellow American friend, Jacob. He releases Jacob from his restraints, grabs a red serum of some type, and they escape through a sewer grate. Back at Chloe's house, Tibbet and Chase return, saying that they never saw Boyce, but he comes back in with Jacob and yells for help. Chloe tends to Jacob's wounds, and Boyce tries to explain what he saw to Ford, showing him the red serum. Ford confronts Waffner about the serum, who's tied up upstairs, and he doesn't want to talk, and eventually Ford has to interrogate him for the information. Boyce isn't very comfortable with these tactics, but Ford says sometimes you have to play by their rules in order to win. A few hours later, they prepare to go to the church, and Ford tells Chase, the photographer, to go and get Waffner ready for transport. Waffner fakes that he's out cold, but when the opportunity arrives, he attacks Chase, grabbing his gun and shooting randomly, hoping the bullets will land. One of them does land in Chase, dead center in the chest before Boyce tackles Waffner to the ground. There's a heartbreaking scene with Chase realizing he's dying, and they lose him. Boyce sees the red serum, and in an attempt to save Chase, he stabs him with it. Nothing happens, and they have to come to terms with Chase's death until he raises from the floor. He seems completely fine for a moment, but then he says he's very thirsty, and then he's very hot, and then his veins start popping out, he becomes very aggressive, and a few other things that I can't show? and Ford has to put him down before anything else happens. But then he raises from the floor once again, and Boyce has to actually put him down. During the scuffle, Waffner sees his opportunity to escape and takes it, taking Paul with him as a hostage. Ford says that if the Germans didn't know they were there, they do now, and a shootout begins as they attempt to get Paul back. Ford lands a shot in Waffner, but he escapes with Paul. Ford says, oh well, we still have a mission to do, but Boyce makes his case to save Paul. Paul. Tibbet says that they can do both, take down the tower and save the boy, and Ford accepts, but lets everybody know their chances of survival now are near zero. They start formulating a new plan, and we switch point of view over to Waffner in the facility. He's very badly injured, and looks for the serum to save him. The doctor warns him that it's not ready yet, it hasn't been tested on humans, but that doesn't stop Waffner from taking not one, but two doses of it. He turns around and we see his face, which I don't think I can show on YouTube, but it looks similar to this photo. Chloe plays decoy and gets one of the Germans to follow her out into the forest on his motorcycle. When he catches up to her, the Americans are waiting for him and form a trap. They send him through the main gates, rigged with explosives, and Tibbet and Jacob are waiting at the tree line to take out any other Germans. Meanwhile, Chloe, Boyce, and Ford make their way into the facility through the sewers. Chloe parts ways with them to go and find her brother, opening up a cell that she thinks her brother is in, but it's certainly not, and just as she's about ready to get shot, Boyce saves her. They find Paul, and Chloe takes him to the sewers to escape. Just as she's about to go with him, the experiment she let loose from the cell starts attacking her. She tries to defend herself, but it keeps coming back. She runs into the main tunnel, 
finding a flamethrower and putting an end to the experiment herself. Meanwhile, Tippett and Jacob are forced to retreat into the town, and Ford plants the explosives in the tower, only to be caught by the disfigured Waffner. Boyce also plants explosives in the lab, but he's caught by the scientist. Boyce takes out the scientist, while Waffner turns the tables and starts interrogating Ford. Boyce comes in and shoots at Waffner, diverting his attention while Ford breaks out of his restraints and takes the serum himself to fight Waffner. They get the upper hand on him, and as they go to leave, Ford locks himself in the lab with the explosives, telling Boyce to go and finish the mission without him because no one, not even their side, should have the serum. The serum takes hold of Ford, and he sacrifices himself to take out Waffner, the rest of the experiments, and himself. Boyce plants the explosives in the tower, and escapes by the skin of his teeth. In the town, Tibbet and Jacob are still fighting the Germans when Paul returns to the town. Tibbet runs to get him, getting shot in the back as he returns with the boy. Chloe shows up and takes down the rest of the Germans. Boyce then returns to town, and we hear the president over the radio confirming the soldiers landed at Normandy for D-Day. Later on, Boyce is explaining what happened to another sergeant, who asks him if there's anything worth digging up, and Boyce says there isn't. The survivors prepare to go on another mission, and the film ends. So after watching this movie again, I could see the clear inspiration for Call of Duty Zombies, or from Call of Duty Zombies, but this got me thinking about the many different experiments that the Axis powers had conducted, and if there were any, at least, semi-truths around the subject. And the answer is... kinda. There were, in fact, groups dedicated to researching the paranormal and otherworldly artifacts, giving some truth to the plots of the Indiana Jones movies, and of course a lot of the different experiments, some involving the dead. A lot of this is speculation, but there are some theorists and even historians that consider experiments like those seen in Overlord as closer to truth than fiction. And while the premise of this film, Zombies in World War II, can sell quite a bit, it's also worth mentioning that this film manages to keep the zombies pretty grounded and also unique from a zombie standpoint. We see a few full-on actual zombies, but the rest come from this serum that makes you a bit indestructible and resistant to any and all pain. I feel like a serum that makes you resistant to pain is something that totally could have been experimented with, and that's the primary effect we see in the film, with the zombies being much more toned down and even a bit unexplained over the serum. And serums in World War II are a very real thing, though I don't think any of them worked quite as well as Captain America's did. This is obviously an incredibly touchy subject, and I can gather that from some of the reviews of the film, calling it disrespectful and glorifying the actions of the Germans, and I suppose you can view any film on war in that manner, especially a more fiction than fact one, but I think this film also highlights the horrors of war in general. This is a horror and action movie, just like most other war movies. They might not always be classified as horror, but this film delves both into the supernatural horror and the natural horror. The first half of this film doesn't have anything even remotely close to supernatural, and there's still horrific moments. The opening plane scene, the landmine, the sergeant's death, all of this is just your typical war film and it's still horrific. But the main through line and message about war comes from Ford's and Waffner's feud. When Ford is interrogating Waffner and Boyce has an issue with it, Ford says that in order to win you have to play by their rules or something along those lines, and later on in the film when Waffner has taken the serum, Ford is also forced to take the serum because in order to win, you have to play by their rules. But this comes with consequences, both morally and physically. The serum really represents the lengths that people will go to in order to win, and how that it's sometimes not worth the risk. So even though this is a fictional horror movie about World War II, there is still commentary about war in general, and I think it's done in a pretty respectful manner to history, while also acknowledging that this is a movie meant to entertain. And entertain, this movie certainly does. This is in all ways, shapes and forms, a B-movie. What do I mean by that? It's an action horror film. It wasn't very expensive to make, you're supposed to feel scared, excited, relieved, and overall just enjoy the film without looking too far into it, so of course I'm making this video. 
looking too far into it. The characters are nothing revolutionary, they're all very standard archetypes, but each principal character has their own clear character arc and enough personality to differentiate between them. Ford is the cold captain who's all about the mission and getting back, but by the end of the movie he's risking his life for the good of his soldiers, and also a completely different mission than the one he was set out to do. Boyce learns to become more of a leader in his own right and stick up for what he feels is the right thing to do. Chloe doesn't just stand by and takes action into her own hands by helping her brother and her new friends. Tibbet doesn't like the kid Paul and ends up risking his life to save him. These are all arcs you've seen in other movies even in other war movies, and they aren't much, but they didn't need to be either. It's easy to root for these characters and like them because of their arcs. They might be plain, but they also work very well. But just because I recognize this as a B movie doesn't make me judge it by lesser standards. Because as far as B movies come, this is exactly how you do one. You might not have the budget to do everything you want to do, leading to some CGI looking not the greatest, but what you do have control over is the script and the practical effects, and both of those are great in this film. These characters are so likable or unlikable because of the script. The dialogue feels realistic and only cheesy during the big fight at the end, which I honestly felt was very in place and purposefully done. There's some absolutely gorgeous cinematography in places that you can tell were shot in a real location and not just with some green screen behind it. You can also feel the tension and the atmosphere that the film creates. When the soldiers are in the village surrounded by enemies, you feel the stakes and how isolated and outnumbered they are. Since this film tells you it's the mission right before D-Day, you know the stakes and how important this mission really is. And yeah, there's some degree where you know they're going to accomplish this mission because, well, D-Day happened, but this is also a zombie World War II film, so all the bets are off in this like alternate universe form of storytelling. The stakes are only increased when Boyce goes into the facility by himself and he sees all of the experiments. You feel very isolated and anxious that he's going to get caught and be turned into one of these experiments himself. All of the emotions that the film wants you to feel, I felt. I hated Waffner, I was rooting for the Americans and Chloe to get Paul back, I was anxious and scared at all the times I was supposed to be, and that's really all you can ask for from a B-movie. Now there is a standout aspect in this film, and that's the action. While nothing too action heavy happens until the later half of the film, it's always been a standout aspect for me and part of the reason why I revisit this film time and time again. While the choreography is nothing special, what I mainly love about this film is that the guns actually work. When a character is shooting, they actually hit their targets, doesn't matter about plot convenience or plot armor, they really work around those in order to show these soldiers as capable warriors who know how to use guns. There's just something so refreshing about watching this film and seeing people actually hit the targets they're trying to and not missing for the sake of plot convenience. It really just ruins a lot of other action movies for me when you have supposedly trained people miss their shots over and over and over again point blank. In Overlord, that doesn't happen, and if they miss their shots, it's because they're moving or occupied doing something else or some actual realistic reason. It just makes the characters that much more likable and the action sequences that much more enjoyable because no one is incompetent or unable to fire their weapon. This is another thing that the film took advantage with. It might take a little while for the action to ramp up, but when it comes, it's very interesting and satisfying to watch. This also just inherently raises the stakes of the film because it sets a precedent for how guns work. When Tibbet goes to get Paul away from the gunfire, you almost knew that he was going to get shot and possibly killed because that's how guns were made to feel in this film. Actual deadly weapons of war. And most movies or shows don't have guns that feel this way, so this is and will always be a standout aspect of this film. Probably the best scene of the film is Chase coming back alive after Boyce injects him with the serum. After doing some research into the scene, I learned that this was all done practically whether that be by makeup or even old school puppetry, and I can't give this film enough praise for its use of practical effects. Even Waffner's face that I can't show is an incredible piece of prosthetic makeup that apparently took five hours each day to apply. All of this adds to the creepy atmosphere of the film and makes viewing it a completely different experience over all of this being done with CGI. I mentioned Captain America earlier, and this film can kind of be seen as an alternate history Captain 
Captain America movie, with Waffner being the Red Skull and Ford being, very ironically, Captain America. Waffner's face is all disfigured because of the serum that he took, kind of, and Ford takes the serum himself in order to combat the effects of the other side and carry out his duty and mission. And yes, I was once very disappointed that this film was not part of the Cloverfield universe, but after all these years later, I'm glad it's its own thing. There was set up for a sequel that unfortunately never came, probably because of the poor box office reception, but it doesn't change my love for the film, and if anything, it just adds to its underrated reputation. This is a B movie through and through, and this is exactly how you do a B movie. The characters are nothing revolutionary, but they each stand out and have their own character arcs, there's a standout factor, and that's the action, but there's moments of tension, suspense, isolation, and horror, and all of these are done incredibly well too. If you haven't seen the film, even if you watch the recap, I highly recommend you checking it out because it's one thing to hear me explain the story, and it's another thing to watch it for yourself. But if you have seen it, what are your thoughts on Overlord? Do you agree that it's underrated, or did you find it to truly just be a cheesy B-movie? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and if you enjoyed, let me know that by leaving a like and subscribe for more content like this. If you do, then I'll see you in the next one. Yeah.